I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and uh, turn to the book of Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 is where you'll find the text for today. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. If you're here at Sweetwater or at McCulloch campus, just grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're in Parker, then uh, go ahead and grab one of the Bibles on the table in the back. If you need to get up and go get one, that's fine. And, and turn to page 72 and you'll find our text, Exodus 20. And as always, if you're at one of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you need one, then please take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, uh, while you're uh, getting settled and finding Exodus 20 and getting your notes out and all that kind of stuff, um, let me just tell you about something I'm really excited about, and, and you already heard about it. It's the Alpha class. Uh, we are kicking off Alpha this week, uh, at least in Havasu. If you're in Parker, we're going to bring that to you later on uh, this spring or summer. But uh, Alpha is for people who just really are new to this whole Jesus thing. So if you're here and you've, you, know, you just recently have started following Jesus and you're like, I don't really know anything. I don't know where Exodus is. Thanks for telling me what page it's on. I don't know uh, all the details of this Christian stuff. Uh, Alpha is for you because it's just uh, kind of a, a Christianity for dummies. And, and, and so you don't know anything. It's perfect. So if you've been uh, coming to church your whole life and you never really learned anything, Alpha is for you. Okay. <laughs> Because you can show up there and nobody expects you to know where Exodus is either. Uh, and you're trying to find the table of contents and go, where is that? Uh, oh, page 72, I knew that. Uh, you, you know, you don't have to fake it. You don't have to pretend you know more than you do. And by the way, if you've been a, a, an active Christian for a long time and you just want to challenge yourself and grow a little bit deeper, Alpha's for you. It, it's a great course to, to kind of build that relationship with Jesus that we were just singing about. And, and so I'd encourage you to check it out. Stop by the table that's outside or at the campuses. And again, Parker, we're going to bring Alpha to you. So be looking forward to that. But if you want to, you can drive up uh, on uh, the evening and attend the Alpha class to drive back. It's worth that uh, trip. So, hey, by the way, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but tomorrow is a national uh, holy day uh, for America. <laughs> we're, uh, we're celebrating the Super Bowl gods. And um, we, uh, most of us have, uh, you know, you know, the, the teams. We call them teams. We don't call them gods. Most of us have the teams that we're rooting for. I know my team can't lose tomorrow, so I'm really excited about that. <laughs> There's not going to be any fear or nerves at all during the game, uh, but uh, just got to find out how many of you are pulling for the Patriots to win. Let me hear you. <laughs> how many of you are pulling for the Rams to win? <laughs> how many of you are more interested in the commercials? Yeah, so commercials have it. So uh, anyway, see, what I really want to ask is how many of you are pulling for the Rams to win because you don't like the Patriots? Uh, so it's like, eh, it doesn't matter who wins. God knows, but he's not going to tell you, so don't bet on the game anyway. The, uh, hey, how many of you currently have or previously had parents? Oh, good. That's going to apply to most of us then. You see, we're in the midst of our guardrail series, and we're looking at the Ten Commandments that were given to us by God to keep our lives from crashing. And, and the first four commandments, the ones we've already looked at, relate to God. Uh, you know, uh, you have no other gods before me, don't make for yourself any idols, don't take God's name in vain, remember the Sabbath. But Jesus summarized those when he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the last six, uh, honor your father and your mother, do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, and do not covet, relate to, to how we relate to our community around us. And, and Jesus summarized those when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and so uh, to, today we're, we're looking at the fifth command, and, uh, and, and notice I, how smoothly i just kind of quoted the ten commandments to you you guys knew those right because you guys have been memorizing them have been learning them You've been testing each other you know when you go out to eat after service or you know in life group i know you're doing that so it, it, that's awesome but uh today we're looking at the fifth command it's exodus chapter 20 verse 12 and it simply says honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the lord your god is giving you Honor your father and your mother. So 
we're going to begin by discussing God's design for family. God's design for family. Because if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, you really might want to understand God's design for your family. I mean, we just sang a song, uh, at least here at Sweetwater, about, you know, building our life on the wisdom and love of God. And, and if we're following Jesus, then that's kind of our, our plan, is to follow Jesus and build our lives on what he thinks and, and on his wisdom. And so we ought to want to understand God's design for family, because God created the world. You know, that's the first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the first couple of chapters of Genesis tell you, you know, what that creation looked like and that God was intentional in its design. And God created the family. And guess what? In the family, he has an intentional design. And, and here's the way the world works best when you do it God's way. It works best. So uh, God's design was for one man and one woman for one lifetime. One man, one woman, one lifetime. That was the design that he had for, for marriage. And by the way, God really wanted to bless us in marriage because, uh, do you know the very first command is in the Bible? It's in Genesis chapter 1. The very first command that God gives in the Bible is to have sex. You guys didn't know that, did you? You're like, I really like God's commands a whole lot better now. <laughs> yeah, he said, be fruitful and multiply. He said, look, I, I, and, and God's the one who made us. He's the one who blessed us. His plans are best when we follow them. And, and so God's perfect model for the family is an intact mom and dad and children who live in that home with their parents and grow up that way. That, that's the best way. Now, that's God's perfect plan. We live in an imperfect world. We live in a broken world. Uh, so we know that there's broken families, there's blended families, there's single parents uh, raising kids. And, and I just want you to know that God's grace abounds. And God redeems our brokenness. Uh, he redeems our failure. He even redeems our rebellion in beautiful ways. Uh, but life works best when we understand and live God's way. So let's talk about God's design for families, purpose for family. This is every family. Uh, he's got these purposes built into everything he tells us. So God designed family for love. For love. The family is designed for nurturing. It's designed for compassion, for intimacy, for care. It's the place designed to teach us how to love and how to relate. Whether that's as spouses or as friends, uh, as parents and kids. Uh, that, that's what God wanted to do. He wanted to teach us how to love. So he gave his family. And then family is designed to protect. I, I mean, family is really supposed to be your safe place, right? It, it, it's supposed to be that place where you are physically, emotionally safe because the world is dangerous around us which is why abuse is such a betrayal. Because the people that God has placed in your life to protect you, harm you. It doesn't matter if it's physical abuse or sexual abuse or emotional abuse. It's damaging because it's, family is supposed to be a, a safe place. And then, of course, family is supposed to be a place that teaches us. It's supposed to be a place of education. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 God says this to Israel, to his people. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Did you catch that? You shall teach them to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Families are designed to teach parents to teach their children the godly values and convictions, the things that God has taught us. We're to teach how to live, how to love, how to work, how to worship. Parents, are you having those intentional conversations if you have kids at home? And then family was designed to prepare us. You know, family's purpose is to prepare kids so that they can be responsible, productive adults. I mean, isn't, isn't that what we want our kids to grow up to be? Responsive, produ productive 
adults. I mean, I hope you don't want them to grow up to be like living in your basement. I know you guys don't have basements. We're in Havasu. But, but you know, you don't, you don't want them to be dependent on you their whole life. You don't want them to, to be a drain on society. You want them to be productive. You want them to be healthy. And, and that's what God gave us families to do so we could re- prepare our kids to grow up and, and help this world, to make it better. So that's God's design for families. And I realize that was just a real brief overview, but, but I, I wanted us to be aware of that. And, and that was, I could have preached a sermon on every one of those points, so uh, uh, give me some grace at that, at that point. But God tells us to honor our parents because if we do that, it's going to bless us. It's going to bless our families and it's going to bless the communities that we live in. Because healthy families are going to make the community a better place. Now, what does God want to accomplish by giving this command? So let's talk about God's desire for this commandment. What is God's desire for this commandment? God gave the Ten Commandments to keep our lives from crashing and to bless us. And a lot of times we are unaware of the blessings that God wants to give us through this specific command. And we're unaware of the blessings he's already given us through this command. Now, first of all, God desires that the people of God will live differently. God desires that the people of God will live differently, that they'll live holy lives. Throughout Scripture, God commands His people to be holy as He is holy. And you know what holy literally means? It means different. It means to be different as God is different. So God wants us to be different like He's different. And and in the context of family, He wants us to live family differently than the people who don't know God, who don't follow Jesus, who don't love them. So at the time of the Exodus... The nations around the Israelites did not respect life and didn't respect family. So the Egyptians. You guys really want to be thankful that you're not one of the ancient Egyptians because if if a prominent Egyptian man died, they buried his wife and servants with him. Yeah, that's a nightmare come true for some of you, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, think about it. They, they, They open up the pyramids and stuff and they find that they got, you know, all kinds of people in there. They buried them with them. Hey, you're gonna, you served him in this life, you're going to serve him the next. You're married to him in this life, you're going to be married to him the next. So they just went ahead and buried him. The Amalekites worshipped this god named Molech. They burned babies as sacrifices. Yeah. So God told his people to be different. I want you to respect life. I want you to care for family. Don't sacrifice your children. Don't abandon your parents. Value your family. That is God's design to bless us. And here's the really cool part. This command not only blessed the Israelites, but it was also given to bless the world. To bless the world. You know, think about the big picture. If you look at at history, just kind of one of those historical realities that everywhere that Christian values spread, the value of family increased. You you look at history and you you see that that cultures that were influenced by the Judeo-Christian ethic promoted life and the sanctity of marriage and the health of families. Because family was important, because they understood God's command. And, and so it blessed entire uh, countries, entire you know, areas of this world, and the people who live there. Now, you can contrast that with other cultures. What, what we know of that, that's going on today, even. So, uh, Muslim culture. They have this thing called honor killings. So that if your kids uh, dishonor you, you can kill them. And it's okay. Some of you are going, that's not a bad idea. (laughs) And we say that as a joke, but we know it's a terrible idea. If you feel like your kids dishonor you, then somebody in the family can go and kill them, and and they consider that okay. Um, In Hindu cultures, uh, India is the the biggest uh, Hindu nation in the world, there is a prevalent culture of rape they warn tourists about it. It's just it's predatory towards women. In China, which is an atheistic culture, uh, they have instituted uh, for a long time a one-child policy. And because they had the one-child policy, they had forced abortions. Uh, they would make you abandon children because of gender or disabilities, or people would do that because they only had one shot and they wanted a son. And as our nation has been moving away from biblical values for at least the last 50 years, 
we've tragically seen our values for life and family decline as well. And it's embodied uh, in, in, in terrible, tragic form in, in the real recent uh, New York State abortion law, where you can kill a baby up until the moment that it's born. You see, God has been blessing families through this command for over 3,000 years. And even when we don't recognize it, we're blessed by God's command. So, so let's talk about this command. What does it mean to honor your parents? How do we honor our parents? I mean, some of us in here have, have buried parents, or, or at least one of them. And, and, and so, you know, what does it mean to honor our parents? Some of us still have parents alive. What does it mean to honor them? Some of us are young, and we have parents and grandparents alive. What does it mean to honor your parents? What do we need to do to stay on the road of God's blessings? Now, it's obviously different actions based on the stage of life. So if you're a child and you're living at home, this is for you. It's really simple. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Okay? So I know some of you are like, ah, oh, rats. He had to bring that up, didn't he? So kids, unless your parents are asking you to do something that is immoral or illegal, uh, you're supposed to obey them. And by the way, cleaning your room is not illegal or immoral. Okay? The fact that you don't might be. But, um, so children obey your parents. I mean, that, that's pretty simple. But what about adult kids? How do we honor our parents? What does it mean to honor our parents? So, so let's talk about three things we can do to honor our parents as adults and, and as our parents age. First of all, we can bless our parents. We can bless. Uh, my parents were not perfect. And uh, I don't think your parents were perfect either. Hey, did anybody have perfect parents? Uh, see, this, kids, this has been a chance for you to suck up a little bit. If you just raised your hands right there, you sit next to mom and dad, I, I have perfect parents. Yeah, but the, we're going to preach on lying in a couple of weeks. So, um. <laughs> But see, the reality is that all parents bless and all parents curse their children. We, we can't help it. Hopefully you want to bless more than you curse, but because of the sin nature in us, we all curse our kids. And, and because we, hopefully you love them, you bless your children. And, and so all parents bless and curse, but where's your focus? If you're an adult, uh, where's your focus about your parents? Are you still complaining about how they raised you? Are you still blaming uh, your mistakes on them? Because last time I checked, you're accountable for your life. Or are you grateful for the blessings and gifts they provided you? You see, to bless your parents is to recognize and communicate gratitude for the good stuff. To say thank you. I've told a lot of stories about uh, my parents being workaholics. And, and you know, I, I mean, they seriously, they, they told us as kids that Labor Day was a day set aside so we could work around the house. And, uh, and as a child growing up, I was not really grateful for my parents' work ethic. Uh, but as an adult, it has blessed me well and blessed my brothers well. And, and so, it, you know, they succeeded in that, uh, raising productive people in society. And so uh, I've had to thank them for that. So have you communicated that gratitude for the good stuff that your parents gave you? Have you said thank you to your parents? Because to honor is to bless them. And if you haven't done this and you're still able to do it, then do it today. Walk out of here. You don't have to go home to call anymore. Take your cell phone out. Call your mom and dad and say, hey, I just want to tell you thank you. E even if all you can say is thanks for not killing me when I was a kid. <laughs> I heard about this culture. They can do that. I'm glad you didn't do it because I know I dishonored you at times. Um, but bless them. And, and if, how do I say this? If, and if your relationship with your uh, adult children isn't healthy, uh, you guys don't talk a lot, you're not close, then why don't you try calling them and apologizing for the curses? Doesn't mean that you, you didn't bless them, but just go ahead and say, hey, I'm sorry that I cursed you in some ways. Because there's some of you sitting here that would love it if your dad or your mom would apologize to you. And some of them can't do it anymore. So go ahead and take that action. It's redemptive. And, and honor your parents and bless them. 
And honor your kids and, and apologize to them. Bless them. So to honor is to bless, and to honor is to care for your parents. To care for. Uh, you see, up until the 1930s, uh, it was entirely up to children to care for their parents. And by the way, it still is in most of the world. Most of the world doesn't have Social Security and Medicare, so uh, the, the family is still responsible to care for their, uh, their parents. And so God's expectation, hear this, this, this is God's expectation, is for children to provide for and care for their parents when they're old and infirm. Jesus made this uh, really clear in, in uh, the Gospels. Mark chapter 7 is one of the examples. You can go home and read this. Because he rebuked the Pharisees, the religious leaders, for trying to use a loophole to get out of caring for their parents. Because here's what they were doing. They were saying, well, the money that I have that I would take care of my parents is dedicated to God, what they called Corbin. Uh, they say, the money's given to God, so I can't use it to care for my parents. Now, they could use it for themselves because they also were dedicated to God. Nice loophole there, right? And Jesus rebuked them. He said, you're, you're disobeying God based on your rules because you're not honoring your father and your mother. He tied it directly to caring for them financially and caring for them physically. So honoring your parents is a financial responsibility from God, even if the government says you're off the hook. Remember, the people of God, we live differently. We have a different standard. We answer to God, not to the IRS. And so honoring your father and your mother is blessing them, is providing care for them, and it means to forgive them. To honor them is to forgive them. I already mentioned that our parents weren't perfect, and neither are we. So we know that we're all sinners because we all rebel. And so all of our parents cursed us in some way. And to honor them is to extend grace to them. To forgive them for the things they did wrong to you. After all, our Heavenly Father is actually perfect. And He forgives us our rebellion. He forgives us our failures. He forgives us our defiance. And loves us as His children anyway. So... Forgiveness is part of honoring. Now, I'm not pretending this is easy because some of you were neglected, some of you were abandoned, some of you were abused. Some of you are bearing scars from childhood that no one should have to suffer. But forgiveness honors God and forgiveness sets us free. Let me say that again. Forgiveness honors God because he asked us to do it. And forgiveness sets us free. He didn't tell us to forgive for the other person. He told us to forgive for us. So if you want to forgive, you're going to have to ask some hard questions. The hardest one is this. How do you honor parents that were or are dishonorable? How do you honor a parent that is or was dishonorable? In other words, they were abusive, they were addicts, they were absent, they were immoral, they were unethical. How do we honor them? Because we're living in this tension, because some of you are sitting here and you're going, I can't honor them. They were dishonorable. So what do I do? Three keys. Forgive, which again, is not going to be easy. You're going to have to go to God and ask Him to teach you how to forgive. You're going to have to be obedient and speak the words of forgiveness even though you don't feel them in your heart and you have to uh, do it over and over and over again. You're going to have to pray for them. So forgive, pray for them. It's the second thing. You, you know, you and God are going to have to have a conversation about them because He will soften your heart and as you obey Him and let go of the anger uh, and, and ask God to bless them, then he's going to do miracles in your life. And then the third thing is break the curse. Whatever way they dishonored you, whatever way they cursed you, then you break that. If you were abused, then refuse to, to abuse. You, you have a healthy home. You, you set healthy boundaries. If they were an addict, you rebel against that. Say, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. You break the curse that they handed down to you. That is a way to honor dishonorable parents. And, and, and I can describe that, but I'd rather you see a real-life story of what this looks like. So uh, here's our new associate pastor, Joe Donahue, telling a little bit of his story about what it is to honor dishonorable parents. 
in a perfect world, parents would not exasperate their children and children would have no problem honoring their father and mother, but we don't live in a perfect world. I grew up in a home I was verbally and sexually abused by my alcoholic father. Um, I, I can tell you stories and of times where my father would tear up the house, he would throw things around, we would be asleep at night, he would wake us all up, uh, destroying things. I even, uh, when I was about uh, 10 years old, even walked in on him while he was raping my mom. How do you honor your father and mother when you come from a dysfunctional home? How do you honor your father and mother when you, you've walked through some type of hurt that the world just simply can't understand, yet you're here, you're alive, and you made it through? How do you honor your father and mother? It's a great question. You live in the truth. See, the truth is, when I became a follower of Jesus in 1991, I experienced forgiveness for my own sin. I was changed. I was made a different person. Galatians 2.20 says that Christ is living in me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You honor your father and mother by living in the truth. The truth is you have been changed. The truth is you have been made new. The truth is you have the ability to honor your father and mother through forgiveness. Now think about this. The most heinous crime and the, the worst act of cruelty that man has ever displayed is nailing a sinless savior to a cross. Yet what did Jesus say? While he was being nailed, while he was being crucified, while the people were there jeering at him, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And if Jesus could forgive the men who abused him, and if Jesus can forgive me, we are certainly able to forgive our parents for abuse we may have experienced at their hand. Through forgiveness, I chose not to allow my dad's screaming voice to control me any longer. Through forgiveness, I chose not to allow the abuse I experienced to control me any longer. Through forgiveness and through living in the truth, I experienced a peace that surpasses all understanding. I honor my father and mother by living and operating in the truth. I was able to forgive my dad. I was able to tell him about Jesus. I was able to be there at his bedside as he passed away, hoping and praying that he would give his life to Christ. I don't know if he ever made that decision or not. When you live in the truth, obviously there are those bad things that occur, but there's also the good things that occur. And when you live in the truth, you can accept both of them. In my hand, I'm holding a six month sobriety AA coin that my dad earned while he was trying to quit drinking. This represents my, my dad's heart. He really wanted to stop, yet he couldn't. For six months though, he did. And I can remember the truth. I can remember the good things as well. Living in the truth sets you free. Living in the light of the gospel sets us free. There is no greater way to honor a parent who has been abusive than by choosing to set yourself free and forgive them. So we forgive. We let go of the anger. We, we let go of the hurt. We let go of the betrayal. And, and it's not immediate. It's a process. But we have to take it seriously. We pray for them. We ask God to bless them. We ask God to help us forgive them. Uh, I love that Joe was able to be there praying for his dad to come to that, that knowledge of Jesus as his dad passed away. And then we break the curse. We do family differently. We refuse to, to follow in those footsteps that lead to destruction. Uh, I love the fact that, 
that God has blessed Joe and Christy with four beautiful daughters, and, uh, and he's living differently than the life that he saw growing up. You see, um, you can do that too. No matter what kind of curses were passed down to you, no matter how dishonorable your parents were, you can break those curses, you can live differently. And if you need help doing that, because we all need help, then help's available. We've got this great ministry called Celebrate Recovery that's available Monday nights here in Havasu. That's right. And, uh, and it will change your life. They, you know, if it's sobriety, then that. If it's uh, anger, then that. It, it'll help you. Uh, if you don't want to do that or you can't do that, we've got counseling available. But you see, you have to take the initiative and say, I need help. I want to change. I want to be a new person. We, we've got, uh, you know, if your marriage is struggling and you're going, hey, I want to do, live in God's design for my marriage, we've got a marriage conference coming up, uh, at one night fight night at the, the 1st of March. It, you see, there's options for you if you decide that you're going to live differently. If you decide that, hey, I want to live in the truth, I want to forgive, I want to pray for, I want to break the curse, then God will help you to honor your father and your mother. One final thought. You really want to honor your father and your mother? Two reasons. One, because it's going to bless you if you do it. Right? Because we're not going to crash our lives. We're going to live in God's blessings. We're going to live under his command. So it's, it's, going to, it's going to bless you if you do it. And secondly, think about this. How you treat your parents sets the pattern for how your kids are going to treat you. How you treat your parents is, how, is what your kids are watching and learning and going, this is how we honor our father and our mother. I pray that you've been able to honor your parents, and I pray that from this day forward, you will honor your father and your mother, and you'll allow God to direct your steps. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, because you loved us enough to adopt us as your children when we confess Jesus as Lord. You bring us into your family with all of our hurts, with all of our struggles, with all of our hang-ups, and, and, and then you teach us how to live as sons and daughters of God. And, and, and Father, you know how difficult that is for us. So today, meet us in this place. Speak into our lives. Call us to health. Call us to healing. Allow us to trust you so that we can be made new, so that we can be those children of God that... that build healthy families so that the world can see the grace and the love of Jesus in our homes. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.